Good morning, church family. It is so good to be back. A handful of visitors with us. I'm sure some of you are passing through. Uh, we, have, we thank you so very much for coming our way and uh, worshiping with us here at the Lake City Church of Christ. If you are one of those visitors that are not passing through the area, but you're from this area, we want you to know that you're always invited to come back and be with us at the Lake City Church of Christ. And if you're looking for a church family, we hope you would consider looking at us. We would love to get to know you, build relationships, relationships with you, uh, help guide you in your journey to drawing closer to Jesus Christ. And if there's any questions we can answer for you that are Bible-based especially, by all means, come and have those discussions with us. Uh, we're just uh, down-to-earth people trying to serve God, trying to go to heaven and taking as many people with us as we can. And though I don't know all the answers, I know where those answers are found, and that is in this book we call the Bible. And so that's really all we're trying to do is draw closer to God through His Word, the Bible. If you are with us on a regular basis, then you know we're in the midst of a series of lessons. A lesson this morning is taken from Colossians. We're studying the book of Colossians. And we're in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 15, as you can see there on the screen. And just a little bit of recap of what we've been discussing. Paul has, to our knowledge, never been to the church at Colossae. But he is on house arrest and he is going to write this letter to them because he has received a visit from their minister. And Epaphras, as he comes and visits Paul in house arrest, Epaphras tells Paul about the church work that he is involved in. And obviously, he says a whole lot of good things about the church work there. But he also addresses some of their problems. And so far in the letter, Paul has been very optimistic about the people there at Colossae. He says, I thank God always for you. You are strong in the faith. You have love for one another. You bear fruit for the Lord, and so on and so forth. But as of this lesson, as of verse 15, Paul is now going to shift gears a little bit and start addressing one of the main problems that the church there was experiencing. He was going to address the problem that existed in the church of this idea that Christ isn't the main thing. That Christ isn't supreme. Christ isn't the preeminent one. You, they were saying, sure, believe in Christ and follow His teachings, but He is not the one that we are serving. And so Paul sees, as we all should see, a problem with that thinking, and Paul writes to address this thinking. And so keep that in mind as we study the passage before us. As we begin, though, let me ask you a question that is debated in many different circles. And the question that I ask you is, who is the greatest of all time? Now, that's such a general question, it's hard to answer that in light of most discussions. Is the discussion in the context of sports? Because if the discussion is in the context of sports, and really it depends on which sports you're talking about, but who's the greatest athlete of all time? You'll see names thrown out there like Jordan and James and Brady and Messi and Ali and maybe Serena Williams and Federer. And, and you'll see these names thrown out there as, no, they may be the greatest of all time, but you know there's not a consensus. There is a debate there. We don't all agree on that. And if your favorite athlete was left out, then that just proves the point that I'm making. Sometimes in the realm of history, they may debate who the greatest U.S. president was. Maybe it's Washington, maybe it's Jefferson, maybe it's Lincoln. Someone may even say maybe it's one of the two Roosevelts. And if I didn't again mention your favorite president, again, it makes the point there is no consensus on who the greatest U.S. president was. It has a lot to do with our subjective opinions on the matter. You know, also in the realm of history, it may be discussed who's the greatest conqueror of all time. Is it Genghis Khan? Is it Alexander the Great? Is it Napoleon? And so you see the point. But when it comes to asking the question as I originally ask it, who is the greatest of all time in any category, you know what the answer is, don't you? The answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greatest of all time. End of discussion. 
And that's what Paul was trying to get the brethren here at Colossae to realize that don't forget Jesus is the main focus. Jesus is the main aim. Jesus is the supreme one, the preeminent one, to use the wording from the New King James text. And so we jump into our discussion with that in mind here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 15. And I offer you primarily two points to consider. And that is number one, that, Jesus, that number one, I want us to notice the supremacy of Christ in creation. That's point number one. We'll discuss that. And then in just a bit, number two, we'll discuss the supremacy of Christ in redemption. Paul organizes his statements on this rather clearly into these two categories, the supremacy of Christ in creation and the supremacy of Christ in redemption. Let's begin with point number one. To begin with, I would just note what the Bible says in verses 15 through 17 of this text. Read it with me. The Bible says, He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation, verse 16, for by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, whether they are visible or invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. He says all things were created through Him and for Him. Verse 17, And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. So before we really delve into those words, let me just say that it is obvious what verse number 15 says, that God has never been seen by mankind in His bodily form. The Bible makes this clear. None of us have been in the actual presence of God and engaged upon the actual face of God. That's what the Bible would tell us, right? You know, over and over again, the Bible makes that point. Um, for instance, in um, John chapter 14, verse number 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Now, let me take you from this passage very quickly and notice what we read in the book of Philippians, rather. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5, notice what Paul writes to another church. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, underline that, Jesus was in His pre-physical state. He is said to be in the form of God, keep reading, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery, what's it say, church family? To be equal with Him. And when we read that and go back to our study here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 15, and the Bible says that He, Christ, is the very image. He is the image of the invisible God. Yes, because in His pre-physical state, if you will, Jesus is God, John 1 verses 1 through 3. Jesus is God. He is equal to God. He considers it not a dishonor to be considered equal with God. And here when the Bible talks about the greatness of Christ, the supreme nature of Christ, the very first thing Paul mentions is this, that Christ is the image of the invisible visible God. Christ is the exact representation and manifestation of God here on this earth. We may not have seen God face to face, but those who were living in the days of Jesus by laying their eyes upon Jesus of Nazareth and His teachings and His miracles and the way He lived, they were seeing the exact earthly representation of the Father. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 1 in verse number 18, the Bible says this, No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten of the Father who has declared Him. Now this word declared in the Christian Standard Bible is revealed Him. The idea is that no one has seen the Father, but there was one who came to make Him known. There was one who came to declare Him and show us who He really was. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I and the Father are one. Think about that for a moment. In John 14, you remember that passage where Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You remember that passage? You believe in God, believe also in me. Now there, that's an important and impressive passage, but the point for this lesson to consider is a few verses down in verse number 7, when there Jesus says to the audience, If you know me, you know the Father. Actually, He put it this way, If you really knew me, then you would know the Father. Father. 
And then a few verses later in John 14 and verse 9, He says, He who sees Me has seen the Father. Why was Jesus able to make that statement? Because in seeing Jesus, they were seeing the Father. In seeing Jesus, they were seeing the earthly representation of God the Father in heaven. And you know again, John 14, 6, Jesus says in this very same context that He was the one and only way to the Father. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father, and you know the verse, except through me, Jesus says. And so here in this first point, the supremacy of Christ in creation, going to back, back to Colossians chapter 1, Christ is the very image and representation of an invisible God, allowing us to see in the form of Christ, God who is not visible to our physical eyes. But there's another thing to consider here. Christ is not just a prophet then, if this is true, and it is true. Christ is not just a prophet. He is not just a preacher. He is not just a rabbi. He is the very image of God in the flesh. And so to know Christ is to know the Father. Therefore, the application is worship Jesus. Serve Jesus. Be fully committed to Him. For in doing so, we are fully committed to the most supreme being in all the universe. But notice also in the text, in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, and what else contributes to His preeminence? He is also the firstborn over all creation. Think about that. He is the firstborn over all creation. Now someone reads this and say, Ah, oh, preacher, there's the proof that Jesus is a created being. Well, obviously, that's not what it's referring to. Obviously, in this passage, what we're reading here is that firstborn signifies rank and preeminence. It does not signify a created status. Christ is above all creation. And another way of putting that, out of everyone who was ever born of woman, Christ is greatest of all. All. That's what it means. But we know what John 1 verses 1 through 3 says, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him there was not anything made that was made. We'll get to that point in just a moment. And so without belaboring the point, because Jesus out of all creatures, out of all beings who ever lived in the flesh... We understand Jesus was the greatest. By the way, Jesus was man, was He not? But was He just a man? No, He wasn't. At His birth announcement in Matthew 1 and verse 23, And He shall be called Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. God in the flesh. John 1 verse 18, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so in that sense, He is the firstborn over all creation. I take you back to Philippians chapter 2. We read only a part of that passage. We read verse number 5, but I want to, in verse 6, but I want to pick up at verse number 7. G Jesus, who in His pre-physical state, was equal to God in every way, but notice He took human form. Verse 7, but He made Himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Though Jesus was God, he was also for a time a man. And he suffered as a man and he died as a man. But he was not just a man. He was God in the flesh. Therefore, all of creation, especially you and I, who are made in God's image, should serve Him and worship Him and be committed to Him as the supreme being of all the universe. Notice what verse 16 back in Colossians 1 says. In Colossians 1 and verse number 16, we continue this first point of the supremacy of Christ in creation. He is the creator of all things. Verse 16, for by Him all things were created. That's John 1, 1 through 3 in a nutshell. 
And it's important to know that, yes, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1 and 2, but it was Jesus specifically who was the builder in that creation, and He is the creator of all things. And because of the simplicity of that point, I'll just make the point and let it be, but I will just notice this, that because Christ is our creator, the proper response is acting in the way that Christ would have us to act as His Creator. Let me put it another way. Why did Christ create me? Why did Christ create me? I think you know the answer to that, but let's look at what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 16. You may remember He says, "...let your light so shine before men <clears throat> that they may do what, church family?" See your good works for what purpose? That the Father may be glorified. The Father in heaven may be glorified. Stated another way in the writings of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 and verse number 10, the Bible says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. For what? For good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them in... First passage, we are created in the image of God to let our light shine, do good works, and glorify the Father. In this verse, we are saved from our sins and created, being made into a new creature in Christ for the purpose of good works that God may be glorified. But when we go back to Colossians chapter 1, and this time notice verse number 17, he says, not only is it true that Christ is the creator of all things, but I want you to notice in verse 16 that all things were created through Him and for Him. We're created for His glory, verse 17. Not only that, but He is before all things, and in Him all things consist... Now, you know what this means. The literal idea here in the word translated consist is that He is the creator of all things, but He's the one who holds all things together. And now, now you just think about that. I mean, the earth is the proper distance from the sun, and the earth spins in the right direction and at the right speed, and the... And, and the the waves of the ocean help to create the, the gravity and, and, and something as simple as the process of photosynthesis and the fact that human bodies can function the way they do. Every breath I breathe in and out of my lungs, every beat that happens in my chest, what's the Bible telling us here? All of that is a gift from Jesus Christ because not only did He create us, but He's holding it all together. Now that's impressive, isn't it? He's holding every bit of it together. And so when I look at the reality of the situ situation, there is so much in this life we worry about. What's the future of our country? How will the elections turn out this year? What about the economy? What about the cost of food? What about the cost of gasoline? What about my employment status? What about my health benefits? What about my physical health? What about the tests that I have coming up? What about the surgery that I have coming up? What about my children? What about my aging parent? We worry about so much in this life, don't we, church family? But you know what I take comfort in? The same loving Creator who holds it all together... He has a vested interest in your life and in mine, and He will see us through. He can hold us together also, can He not? And I take comfort in that. And then we see in verse number 18, we get to point number 2. So we see the supremacy of Christ in creation. He is greatest of all. There is no debate. But starting in verse number 18, he shifts gears ever so slightly and talks about the supremacy of Christ in redemption. And this is an important word that is used. He starts off by saying in verse 18, And He, Christ, is the head of the body. And what is the body? It is the church. That's important. That's important to know that the word body and the word church are used in place of one another. We may say interchangeably. Interchangeably. 
I believe someone offered a prayer this morning. I apologize for forgetting who, but in that it was, it was Jim. Jim in his prayer, he had reference to the fact that Christ is the head and we're the body. We are the hands and the feet of the Lord in this earthly existence and we may never forget that. I am not the head of the church. No man is the head of the church. No tradition is the head of a church. No idea is the head of the church. Based on this verse, who and who alone is the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church. And He is the head of the body, the church. When a church forgets that Christ is the head, you know what goes wrong, don't you? Everything goes wrong. Our priorities are a miss. Our activities are futile. When we forget that Christ is the head, we have missed the entire purpose of what we are doing. Christ is the head. Let me just make this simple observation that all of you are already thinking, my foot doesn't tell my brain where to go. My brain tells my foot where to go, doesn't it? My head, my brain, my thinking processes, it controls every member of my body. And when it does not work that way, I'm in serious trouble. I know we humans want things to be easy. I know we want things to be enjoyable. I know we like entertainment. I know we like and we could run the gamut of things we could mention there. But if we're following Christ faithfully, who's running the show, me or Christ? If we as a church are trying to be a biblical church, practicing biblical Christianity, who is the master in that scenario? It's Christ Jesus. And so, never forget that Christ is the head of the church. But number 2 in verse 18, He is the head of the body, the church. And also it says, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He's the first. Out of all who have ever been born of woman, He's the greatest. But this verse is saying something different. It is saying that He's the first one to be resurrected from the dead and what is implied here, never to die again. Because obviously, in the story of the Bible, Jesus is not the first one to be raised from the dead. We have the widow's son at Nain. We have many other examples we can give. But what this is saying is that Lazarus, he was raised from the dead, but what would Lazarus eventually live long enough to see again? Jesus died and he's still alive. Jesus died and He will always be living. Peter said it best when Jesus said in Matthew 16, But who do you, my own students, say that I am? And, they said, and Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. God is living. Jesus Christ is living. Every name that I mentioned at the outset of this lesson, whether it's Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, or someone who is still living like Jordan and James and Messi and all of those, those are all people who either have died or will die, but not so of Jesus. Jesus is alive. Jesus conquered death for you and for me. He is the greatest of all time. End of debate. And that's the point that Paul is making in Colossians chapter 1. And so he is the firstborn from the dead. I would reference 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8 as a solid set of evidence for that resurrection. Over 500 eyewitnesses to that. And then in verse number 19, the Bible continues by saying, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell... Just make a note of that, that in Christ, Jesus is deity in the flesh. He is the very representation of the Father, but He comes back around to this statement and says, actually, Jesus is not lacking anything in His deity. He has all the fullness of the Godhead. Another passage would say, He has all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is not any less God than the Father or the Spirit. Let's move on, though, very quickly. And notice what he says in verse number 20. He says in verse number 20 this. He says, And by Him, that is through the Father through Christ, by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him whether things on earth or things in heaven, he goes on to say, having made peace through the blood of 
of His cross. Now, you know what this word reconciled means. And I'm not insulting anyone's intelligence by, by um, defining it, but for sake of clarity, let me define it. The word reconciled is the idea of renewal. It is the idea of restoration. It is the idea specifically in context of, of relationships that two parties are at odds with one another and peace is made and agreement is made for them to be in good standing once again. And, and you know all of the passages that I could mention here, but Isaiah 59 verse number 2 says what? That my iniquities have done what? Separated me from God. There's a problem there, church family. The Bible says that the wages of my sin, Romans 6, 23, is what? The Bible tells me actually in the book of James that if I'm cons persistently living a life of sin, here's the wording of the Bible, I am an enemy, an enemy of God. I am estranged, I am alienated, I am like a stranger to Him, the Bible says. And actually tonight we're probably going to delve into the verses that come after this and, and uh, make, you know, include more depth there. For the sake of this study, those comments will suffice. I'll say this though, that when we, when we look at the reality that because of my sin I am separated from God, because of my sin I am alienated from God, because of my sin I am an enemy of God, when I face that reality I am in dire straits. But then I read passages like this that say, no, 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 not so fast. God sent His Son and Jesus gave His life and through the blood that He shed on the cross I can be reconciled back in a right relationship with my God. I hate being at odds with people, don't you? I hate there to be turmoil between two individuals. I love peace. Jesus commands us to be a peacemaker. The relationship I want to have peace in before all others is a peaceful relationship with my Lord and my Savior. He will reconcile us. There is no one... Here's what Peter would say in John 4 verse 12. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name Jesus Christ. The greatest conquerors, the greatest presidents, the greatest athletes, our heroes of times past or of the present, they pale in comparison because no one can forgive me of my sins. We sing the song, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus is number one. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is the preeminent one, as the passage says there in verse number, the, the, verse number 18. The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. No one comes before him. So what is the application of this information? The application is pretty obvious that it's easy to, and this book will later address this, it is easy to seek after covetousness, Paul in this book says covetousness is just idolatry, it is serving self. He says it's easy to uplift some other figure, it's easy to have this is our number one priority in life, but Christ is first of all, He is greatest of all time, therefore worship Him and Him only. Therefore serve Him with every fiber of our beings. Therefore be committed to Him like we've never been committed to anything or anyone else. That's what Jesus means in Matthew 22 when He says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. For this is the first and great commandment. No wonder Jesus said in Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. The lesson is simple. Christ is greatest of all times. Serve Him. Commit to Him. Sacrifice whatever necessary for Him. And we begin that process with faith. The willingness to change, the Bible calls that repentance. By confessing the precious name of Jesus as we discussed this morning in Bible class. By being baptized, immersed into water for the remission of our sins, contacting the blood of Jesus. Preacher, I've done that, but I've gone astray. Repent and pray. We'll pray with you. Come back to the Lord. Come back to the greatest. You'll never regret it. Please choose wisely as we stand and as we sing. Oh.